Hi. Hi there. Hello. I haven't got any Christmas baubles. <laughs> I, I, I've been trying to, to handle it, but uh, yeah, it's important. Well, the bar has enough for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello, Kate. Hi, Richard. Hi. Happy nearly Christmas. Well, it's, it's happy Hanukkah in my case. because Of it, course, it, happy Hanukkah. Yes, that's yeah, today, so isn't we it? We actually have something. Uh, Christmas is coming. Yeah, it's it is. and the Christmas tree at the same time, but this year they've spread apart. <laughs> no, it's an exciting time. What What's the phrase happy holidays, not to offend anyone? Something like that. That's, I think that's quite a sort of a new, new neologism. I think it's a, or maybe it feels more American than British. I don't know. Uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're, it, we're, it sounds very American to me. We're, we're picking it up, I've noticed. Here, Richard, more appropriate. Those four candles. <laughs> Those candles are very subtle. They, they kind of whoa, like... whoa. And the winner of the home <laughs> now there is a there is a uh, a, a, a remarkable image. <laughs> is, is that the word you used to describe? I'll, I'll have to switch off the lights. So I have to say, this image uh, is going to stay with me for a long time. <laughs> It'll stay with me for a long time as well. It'll be embedded in my retina. Oh, that's beautiful! Beautiful. <laughs> I really, I really, I really I like your balls. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Good to see you in almost in person. Almost in person. Yes. Right, it's nice to see you as well, Richard. Hello. We did try to get you to the Center for Book Arts a few years ago. Uh, yes, I know. I know. I know. That was a that's another story for another time. Yes. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. All right, cheers, everybody. There may be a slight background noise for me because there is a children's workshop going on downstairs. <laughs> yes, I'm so, so if you hear so if you hear if you hear screaming, um, it's either the local carol singers or the children downstairs. You're getting ready to slide down the chimney. Cheerful holiday screams. Well, what it is, what it is, is this is between us. I hope. What it is 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 it's an after school arts club. You see. And, and it's another extension of, of parents' personal time, basically. But the kids love it, and they're producing fantastic work. And I'm really quite jealous. But there we go. I've tried to infiltrate, but I do show up slightly. But there we go. Anyway. Even, even looking like this? Yes. Yeah, even looking like this. And, and next year, I'm going to be... Yeah, anyway, that's going to be that's another story as well. Anyway. So I... Uh, <laughs> I, guess, I guess we're starting without without Rita. Yes, and I'm sorry, I've got to leave a bit early because I've I've managed to get a doctor's appointment and see to see a doctor in person, which is quite an amazing thing. So I can't. can't how did you, how did you how did you wangle that exactly? So I can't not go. <laughs> I mean, I've been dying to see. The only time I can see my doctor is in the pub. <laughs> the best yeah, and to be honest. <laughs> And you know, it's the, the advice I'm being given. Oof. Sure, it's not the right kind of doctor, there, Mark. Well, I, I mean, they do do say he's a doctor. I, mean, I haven't actually inquired as to what sort of doctorate they have. I mean, for all I know, actually, with with the advice I've been getting, I think he's a local veterinarian. Mm. Because, this is not a, because, a doctor of philosophy, you know. No, 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 because the suppositories, the suppositories he's been giving me are oh. rather large, <laughs> rather large. And, <laughs> you know, I, and he told me to self inject with a syringe this big. I mean, I'm thinking, what am I meant to I can't use that. Anyway, I'll be recording, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that uh, we, we started perfectly. I just probably I just probably need to read us in and uh, you know tell everybody that that's iBook Bindings podcast and uh, we're recording our holiday special edition I don't know what so um, happy happy holidays happy Christmas Merry Christmas uh, happy Hanukkah 
uh, and uh, everything else that you can be celebrating on any dates uh, uh, in December on, or early January, because in Russia, Christmas is on the 7th of, uh, of January. In Armenia, it's on the 6th, as far, as far as I remember. So yeah, it's, it's a long month. And oh, and we celebrate the old new year on the 13th of January. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit bizarre in Russia. Very complicated. <laughs> yes, yeah. but I guess it's just just to have a, to have a uh, good cause for drinking for thirteen days. Yeah, well. it's a long it's a long winter. You've got to do something. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, you've got yeah. to you stretch it out a little bit. You know? <laughs> yeah, stretch it. Especially out. as yeah. as currently in Russia, there are something like ten days off in the beginning of January or something like that. So yeah, you you just don't have anything else to do besides drinking. Um, I mean, so unlike, unlike other days in Russia, right? <laughs> <laughs> Happy holidays, uh, anyway. So um, I'm Stepan, as usual. I'm uh, I'm I'm uh, recording from Visay. Pavel, my co-host, is uh, joining from Moscow. Kate Holland and uh, uh, Mark Cochrane join us from from the United Kingdom and. Uh, uh, Richard Minsky joins us from the United States, from New York. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi. Nice to see you here. Uh, there should have been uh, Rita Udina with us, uh, uh, a book conservator from uh, Barcelona, from Spain, but uh, unfortunately, she wasn't able to join us today. Well, next time, we will definitely... For those of the viewers who want to see her, they can see the last Christmas special. Yeah, the previous one <laughs> a year uh, ago. Yeah. And, and maybe the Spanish version of our podcast, uh, uh, which uh, uh, she, she, she was co-hosting. Uh, so, yeah, definitely. So, 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 hey, so, so glad to see all of you here. And uh, uh, how, how was it recently and uh, throughout the year? Uh, who's going to go first? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, Mark, you had so many appointments around uh, December, so you are working, teaching, moving around the country, there and back. How's it going? It's 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 going okay. Uh, I just did a workshop at uh, the wonderful Flatford Mill, which has been absolutely fantastic. A little cold. See, the buildings were built in about you know sixteen hundred, that sort of thing. There's big gaps. The woodwork's falling away. The plaster work, the wattle and daub. I mean, it's not primitive, don't get me wrong, but it's a little bit cold. I don't like that. But, uh, you know, thermal underwear, I'm fine. And, and you know, copious cups of warm coffee is fine. Actually, I wish I could be drinking wine now. Uh, but, yeah, that's fine. And it's, it's been really cool. I've, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a great end to the year. I'm looking forward to uh, the new year, as I'm sure everybody is, of course. And, um, yeah, it's been great. It's been, all in all, it's been an all right year, in a nutshell. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Kate. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it's also been it's been crazy busy up till about two weeks ago, and now I just feel like oh, I can relax. But actually, I can't relax because I'm thinking oh, I've got this commission and this commission and this development and this. So I'm working actually with my son on some so looking and in, introducing some technology into some books. So that's quite exciting, and. Um, we did the book of both Mark and I just did the Booker Prize, so that yeah. was kind of frantic. Get mm -hmm. health leather, get it already in time. Yeah, and and we had to get work in for an exhibition at the same time as well. Same date, same day, hand in. Nice mm -hmm. timing, guys. Yeah, cool. So, <laughs> no clash there then. <laughs> Perfect. But you know, we did it. Yeah, yeah. We're prof uh, yeah, we're professionals. I've been just discussing with with another person that uh, I, I sort of started uh, tuning myself to this vacation vibe or something because so we plan to go uh, to moscow somewhere on 20th or 23rd something like that we are getting our third shot on the 17th of december because uh, emmanuel macron just uh, announced that uh, french uh, people well, and people residing in france uh, can can finally start getting their their third shot so uh yeah we registered uh, right away and uh, uh it wasn't easy, but yeah, it's it, 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 it was fun. So I sort of already tuning in to this uh, uh, vacation uh, holiday vibe, and I, I hope there will be not as much work uh, uh, moving forward. So Richard, how is it uh, uh, on your side of, of the ocean? 
I don't know, the last uh, couple of years, it always seemed to be Friday. So uh, it, the weeks kind of flew by in a very strange way. Uh, the, uh, the good news was that uh, uh, in November, I was granted the patent on my pop-up display apparatus. So now I can make the boxes that um, they close on your book. And when they open, the book is on a, a display easel. And that's exciting because uh, when I finish the commissions that are now in the shop and a book that I'm producing of another artist's work, I can get to work selling the patent to manufacturers and maybe have some um, uh, IP income. Fantastic. Is that your first patent? How does that work? Yeah, right? It's my first one. Congrats. Congratulations. I, I, I never knew you could, you could even do that. So. <laughs> It's it's uh, it's complex. Was the complicated process? Do you need to prove something? Oh, yeah, 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 you you have to apply and uh, you have to make claims that you have an original invention. There's there's different kinds of patents. This is actually a utility patent. It's not just a design patent uh, for something to look like something. This is for the actual mechanism that causes the box to open and the display to rise up, and uh, that uh, you have to. Uh, specify everything and you have to make claims. So I, I made 20 claims and all of them were granted and you have to provide drawings that provide a very clear um, representation of what it is that you are claiming so that anybody who is in your field can make it. And it's supposed to be obvious from your drawings and your explanation how this thing works. So that uh, that took uh, a while. Well, congrats. Cool, 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 cool. cool. You know, it's, yeah. Even merrier yeah. <laughs> this quality cool. season. <laughs> you know, here, there's, um, you know, they're like this, you know, there are, you have to have all these drawings of, uh, of the mechanism and all that. And, uh, and then pages and pages of text that explain it. So all, almost almost a Hanukkah miracle, finally getting this patent. Yeah, I mean, it really is. Uh, I mean, I've never gotten one. I mean, there are people who are inventors, you know, who just get, that's what they do is they get patents and then they, they live on the residuals of that. But uh, now I have to figure out like, you know. What to do with it. <laughs> you know, it, could, it could go anywhere. It could, it could be used for like pop-up electronics displays and, and as well as for rare books and artists easels that are also paint boxes. And, you know, I've had to come up also with all the possible uses for it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fun. That's fun. There's, a, there's, there's the question about how books should be displayed, isn't there? That's, you know, how, you know, we put our books in boxes and then, they, then, then you hand over the box. And the collector or whoever's bought it opens it up and you know wow exciting but but then it gets put back in the box and all exactly. you see is the spine on the shelf mm -hmm. and it's, it's working out a, a system of how to display our books so people can see them all the way around so it's not just the front cover mm -hmm. and quite often you hand over a book and then people look at the insides of the book and you're like i haven't had anything to do with the inside, the inside. <laughs> and there's, there's all, it's the outside yeah the books have insides yeah, <laughs> they, they don't care. <laughs> of course they do. Course they do. Some, 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 some of my don't have anything on the inside. <laughs> I, I think that's something that uh, we uh, discuss with Kate almost during every of our recordings. Uh, mm. disp display of the books and the book stands and uh, the fact that they're usually displayed in a way that uh, doesn't allow a, a viewer uh, or visitor of the exhibition to, you know, to, to know uh, almost anything about the book <laughs> so yeah that's that's a pity yeah I, well I personally i think with today's technology that is available even on a very limited budget uh, stuff can be done uh, i just sometimes think it's a bit of laziness on the curator's perspective myself um you know and saying right you've got to yeah the ways of doing it i mean it doesn't take much thought to do but that's from my perspective anyway uh, I've heard of experiments uh, with robotics because there's another problem. Often you have a book and 
if it's static, you can't really see the structure, how it opens, how yeah. it interacts with it. So in yeah. theory, you could make a robot that turns pages, opens the book just to show how it pops up. So you, you need this this small IKEA robot, which opens the book uh, uh, 10,000 <laughs> times until it breaks. <laughs> until the book falls apart. No, yeah, but, but there is another perspective, of course, and that's the, the recorded moving image. Yeah. And you know you you can you know with a QR code or whatever it is on your phone you bang it in and the small little film comes up of, of the of the person who's actually made it giving a VO voiceover and explaining how it works and the design ethos and everything else I and mean, it's not rocket science it can be done it just takes a little bit more effort and I sometimes think that with with the book a lot of people that are organising exhibitions and things are, are relatively conservative. And, um, you know, it, it's, I, I pers- well, that's what I'm going to be starting next year is actually creating small films about the work that I've done, including work in process and everything else, which gives a, a full around a picture to it. Plus, it, and also, one is usually limited to, you know, with exhibition catalogues and things, explain your design ethos in 50 words or less. <laughs> and you're thinking, I wouldn't even get, I can't even tell how I open the door in 50 words or less, <laughs> not alone in my design ethos and including materials and colours, because let's face it, colours are very important. And you think, oh, come on, you know, there's so much more we could be doing. Um, and if you look at other um, creative disciplines, I mean, that's what they do. You go into your local superstore, your local shopping mall or whatever, and there are stuff popping out all over the place. It's called marketing. And I think that sometimes we're a bit slow to get on that wagon, but that's that's what my my wife does. <laughs> exactly. Now I need to have a chat. I really do. Mm-hmm. But I think. We, we, but I we th- can organize it for for a small fee, you know. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. I've, I've got a I've got a spare can of beer if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the postage may be a bit heavy, but no, seriously. I mean, it's not. It's not. It's something that I'm seriously I'm going to be looking into in the new year. It's um, you know I've, I've got a modest thing that I can do, and and why not? You know, it's not. And actually, I do, I, and I and I do have a technical person who does actually work for beer. So, like most of us, Kate. Okay, last, yes. last time we talked, you uh, 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 I think you said that you like to add uh, explications to uh, to your books so that. Uh, owners and uh, future conservators knew how you uh, how you made it. Uh, um, how, how long have you been doing this, and why did you start? Was this your practice from the very beginning? Um, well, it seems like good practice for any binder to do this. I mean, it, it just seems pretty basic that you should hand over some notes uh, explaining to the collector or the commissioner, you know, the design ethos in more than fifty words. And you know, you've got as much space as you want to fill with images that you've been influenced by or um, the materials that you've used or the um, processes that you've used. A, for conservators in the future, if it all falls apart, they know how to, what to, how to deal with it and work with it. But also um, I think as much, the more you can explain to the public or non-binders about what we are, how much is involved in, in creating a fine binding, you know, the more they'll understand and hopefully the more money they'll eventually pay. You know, this is we're still, I feel very, very priced, very low for the amount of hours that go into it and the amount of thinking and the amount of, you know, time. It's um, at the amount of technical skill. It's not just like silversmithing or and I'd say I don't mean just silversmithing, but, you know, or just ceramics. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> they have, I'm sorry, silversmiths and ceramicists. But um, they have one skill is, is handling clay, whereas we as bookbinders have to handle paper and leather and gold and, you know, we have to manipulate things. We also have to think and, and research and, and come up with ideas. I mean, it's just so, such a huge range of, I'm sorry, I'm bigging us up hugely here, but I think we need a lot more bigging up. I don't think the, the real world really knows that we exist. And um, the more you can explain to people what goes on into a fine binding, hopefully the more that they'll they'll get it and um, and want to be part of it and want to. Do, do you think, though, that the book is more of an intellectual process? 
the actual concept of the book is more of an intellectual process than let's say you know looking at a vase in a gallery and saying that's a nice vase nice color glow it's not it's not a singular plane of thinking is it it's not mm. just you know um look at an object or a flat piece of art it's it's because we are responding to another artist's writings and maybe another artist's illustrations and let alone the typographers or the I don't know, the, you know, there's so many different aspects that we as another layer coming on top have to think about. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's so then, yes, the viewing public have to take on all those different layers. And hopefully we are promoting and, and you know, um, uh, expounding correctly and, and they're, they're understanding what, what we're trying to put across. And, uh, and also there's the, the thing about artists in other fields having their platforms like Grayson Perry, who explained to the public that he doesn't just make vases. Mm. He's also a, a cross-dresser. He's also a political activist. And, uh, uh, and I think bo books uh, should tell those, those, uh, sto uh, those stories. And they do tell those stories, but not many people know about it. Because there's this uh, thing about decorative arts, like if uh, if you can put it on your shelf, then it's not an, an artwork, which is ridiculous. I think books are not just pretty thing, fine, you know, they're not just things to look at. They should be things to stimulate the, the, the little grey cells and get people talking and, and maybe bringing in, you know, current political um, ideologies or, or exploring historical context or, you know, there's so much more to just making something that looks nice. We, we talked quite a bit about books as political statements with Richard and uh, uh, so R Richard, I, I wanted to return to you and uh, what, what are your plans for for the for the upcoming months and uh, do you think do you have anything interesting you you just before the uh, recording started you told that uh, things started to move uh, uh, like like at, at, at in normal times now or or i don't know maybe better i don't know so what's what's going on i think things are grinding to a start okay you know, so I they they haven't <laughs> started yet but <laughs> okay <laughs> You know, I, I have most of my uh, business uh, is with academic and museum libraries. And I have like seven, between 75 and 100 libraries that I deal with. Uh, books that I, uh, you know, my book art, uh, some of them. And uh, then I also make bibliographic works that also are book art that are handmade, uh, handbound. Uh, books on the history of book bindings, of, in particular of American publishers bindings, trade bindings, because it was a neglected field. So I, uh, I, I did the books, you know, I, I, I established that. And so with these libraries, on March 12th of 2020, they all closed. I mean, whoever thought that you, your business uh, your entire field would close down in one day. It was just something that never entered my mind as a possibility. So it's one of those things that just like came out of nowhere. So I just had to figure out uh, how do I continue? I'm a, a hermit. You know, I live out in the middle of nowhere with like no sidewalks and, and, and you know, surrounded by a moat pretty much. And uh, literally. And so the, the change to being isolated for a year and a half wasn't much of a change because I'm always isolated, but I used to be able to actually ship stuff out. And that was the big difference because I would ship stuff out and then money would come in. And, <laughs> it, it, and so I ended up, um, actually what I did is I assigned myself a project for it, which I still haven't quite finished. Here, this, um, uh, I got a three volume copy of the first complete English translation of the Decameron. So I, I guess pandemic I found that. Pandemic should last for a bit longer so that you can finish well, you this know, project. It's not, it's not over yet. So I still have time <laughs> to make the triple slip case. I got another version of the same one. I made the triple slip case for that here. here. Um, that was fun because I, I got to invent a new kind of triple slip case, not patenting it, but I promoted it on. Uh, but here, I've got a nice triple slip case. This is the 1896 publisher's binding on, 
it was the first translation in English that actually um, translated all the dirtiest and funniest passages of the Decameron that had been prohibited by the censors. So up until then, uh, 1886, the, um, uh, the British editions had all the really um, filthy, uh, crazy oh. sex oh. Scenes, uh, in Italian or in French oh. uh, in order to avoid the censors. But so I was trying to figure out how do I, so I made this as a chemise and it's, it's like a hard chemise. It's got this, you know, you see, I was able to just pull it right out. And then it just falls out of the chemise like that because it is a chemise that's open on two sides. So it's like a, a slip case without a top. A line. So it's very easy. Yeah. And then that just slides right back into the into the uh, real slip case. And so that's what makes it very easy to leave the box on the shelf and pull out one book at a time so the other books don't fall down. Well, if it's good as read as you would say, I'd be getting all three books out at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, oh. I, I, I was I was always quite surprised by the uh, sort of prudishness of uh, American uh, uh, censors and the controllers and uh, the whole system in total and uh, the well the words we cannot uh, uh, say on on even on YouTube uh, uh, because otherwise we will be uh, you know uh, uh, punished uh, by our advertisement money or something like that. Uh, that's just a bit too much. Dear, I, I might have said them all in the last interview. I'm a bit worried now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have nothing on Richard, I have to okay, say. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually watched my tongue. I, 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 I had to stop every now and then and find a palatable word. Well, yeah, yeah, it, it works for, for most of the of our recording, but it was three hours, so I think at the, in a couple of uh, uh, moments, uh, uh, you, 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 you added some, some you know, choice words, uh, but, but, well, that's okay, we are still too small, to, you know, to, to care about the ad, ad revenues or something, <laughs> so we're okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I remember reading uh, the Bodlerized version uh, of Shakespeare. Uh, you know, this guy who uh, reprinted Shakespeare without the juice, uh, juiciest bits. And I was surprised to find out that the same editor, the same year, published Bible. And I remember as a kid reading the Bible and being, whoa, whoa, more of that. Tell me more. He did what? Wow. Yes. It's all of this begotten and beheld and all of this stuff. You think, whoa. And then you go to your Sunday school tutor and you say, what does begotten mean? And, it, and all of a sudden there's this hush and they go, well, you need to talk to your parents about that. And you think, oh, okay. I mean, he was required to have sex with his dead brother's wife or God would punish him. <laughs> that was a big one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, 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 in, 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 the, in the spirit of Christmas, <laughs> we're, 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 we're talking religion in the, in the spirit of Christmas, and we're addressing the Bible as a, um, a sex education toy. Yeah, uh, I'm not. I, <laughs> I, I guess we'll get some some angry, you know, some angry dislikes or something because last time we recorded the, our live stream, uh, we talked about firstly. Uh, bookshops located in churches, and and secondly, we we talked about some uh, some queer uh, booksellers or something like that. And there were some angry, angry viewers who who uh, decided to 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 you know to post angry dislikes or something like that. <laughs> okay, oh, it, I, it I, I get a I, I get a lot of those. I get a lot of those. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> well, perfect then. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Kate, I really want uh, to ask you about your big project of the uh, of the last year. You oh, mentioned, wow. it, mentioned it a couple of times. Could you uh, tell us a bit about it? Still a work in progress. Um, I was, uh, for better or worse, asked by a US publisher to bind, rebind a first edition of Breakfast at Tiffany's and in his words, cover it in diamonds which I'm going like, whoa, great, <laughs> okay. So we're you know, trying to make it so that it is um, classy, tasteful, uh, not too bling. Um, uh, <laughs> so covered in diamonds, not too bling. <laughs> <laughs> Was it? So, pimp, this tracks. Pimp, <laughs> pimp my book. Yeah. So, anyway, 
um i've got the uh the jeweler who did the um damien hurst skull but we're not going that bling um he's gonna make all the settings and we're gonna have an ebony bird cage and we're gonna have a glass oh, this is the 3d printed uh plinth we're gonna have a glass plinth that it's gonna sit on as if in flight and anyway so yes it is it is still happening i'm um i'm in in prototyping stage at the moment um i think it will be interesting yeah who's that american entertainer liberace comes to mm. mind somewhere or other mm. i think it's rhinestones but I, yeah. I yeah i'd be interested to see that so, so mark uh, there is mm. uh, uh, there is the first uncensored edition of uh, of the cameron on richard's size there there is a uh, uh, diamond covered book on kate's side what what can you share with us do you have oh, anything uh, interesting you know <laughs> well well i it's funny you should say that <laughs> because because uh, this is maybe the other side of stuff is the other um, side of diamonds well yeah yeah we're talking <laughs> shh, stuff other stuff um yeah i bury stuff so you know but no um what it basically is 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 i've, I've got this idea for um I, I some of my work has been in the past um censored shall we say or refused for exhibition because of elements within it or, or whatever whatever and so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be producing a, a book of my censored work um, so that's something that I'm going to be working on myself and I'm working in consultation with 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 somebody who does have a doctorate though he isn't a doctor really not the vet don't worry it's, I'm talking I'm talking with somebody else that's the other doctor yeah he's yeah he's they do not give of, you they do not give you some you know medicine no no it, no no he doesn't he's a doctor of words he's a doctor of words and um so i'm working so so the, of, you know, his his pills are even more bitter i guess well well i can't say i'm not going to drop any names because i'm not like that you know i'm not like that but 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 he is a household name okay um, in, well, it depends how old you are. I mean, if you're three, it's not household, but it is a household name, and in the UK at least. And um, yeah, so, so it's going to be quite. That's going to be quite interesting. But I'm also going to be working on um, a series of books which are going to be um, uh, very physical in in in, in their sense and um, sort of quite urban and more sculptural. Uh, well, obviously keeping within the form of the book perhaps maybe or wherever we go with it but that's basically what i'm going to be you know that's 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 what it is it's not diamonds wish it was uh, uh, could, could you give us some examples of, of your censored uh, works and why they were censored what did you well, do no i can't no i can't because it's been censored <laughs> i mean I, I you know but let's to, to put you know I can't, seriously but there will be a book being produced that contains all my censored work. Um, uh, aren't you afraid it, it will be censored? <laughs> I'm self-publishing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to be a limited edition of maybe 10, I don't know, something like that. Uh, but it is going to be quite, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's <laughs> You, you, you plan it so this, it, it can fit, uh, the whole the whole edition can fit into your uh, small exhibition space, I guess. Uh, I wish it would, but fortunately there is quite a lot of it. <laughs> so, so it can't actually fit into base, uh, the book arts, art space, whatever it is, can't fit into there. But yeah, it will be, and it, it, yeah, that's that's one thing I'm going to be working on. Um, I'll, I'll keep you posted as to developments on it. It's going to be quite interesting. Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Later on, I'm going to be getting out. Yes, later on, I'm going to be getting out of my skull. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> well done. I thought that was quite good. I found that in a river. It's great, isn't it? What is it, cow? No, a horse. Why is thank, it thank, you, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yes, it is a horse. It's a horse, it's yeah. a horse. So why would a horse be in a river? Dead, dead in a well, river? Surely someone would. Because it was oh, dead. <laughs> well, look, I don't know. I wasn't there at the time. I just found the head. It's pretty cool. It is, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's really good. Yeah. It kind of looks like Edvard Monk's The Scream when you hold it at a certain angle. Oh, well, it, it, <laughs> well, if you look at it that way, it's really weird. Thing is, at Halloween, I had this on the door of the studio. 
no visitors. <laughs> Nobody, nobody knocks, no kids. There's a lot of crying outside the door, but there was no, no knocking at the door. <laughs> so. uh, uh, speaking of kids, uh, I assume yes. lo lots of teaching now and even more teaching, hopefully, in the new year. What are your plans in that regard? Uh, me? Uh, all of you. Uh, 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 well, um, well, let's start well, with you. Maybe, well, you maybe not teaching kids. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe teaching some older kids. Or like kids. Like <laughs> yeah. No, well, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm sowing the seed of the creative book and everything with 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 younger people, and it, it's it's one of these things. I've got oh, yeah, I've got I've got a new teaching venue perhaps uh, next year, which is going to be quite exciting. It's a rather posh, grown up affair. You know, everybody's very nice. Also cold. I can't, can't say. <laughs> uh, I, no, I can't say because though though the, the papers have been signed and everything, you know, it's all got to be ratified and everything. Isn't that? I've got to be careful. But that's going to be a new teaching venue, um, and then I'm going to be developing some new courses in the studio, um, and then I'm going to be working with some of my biblically naughty chums overseas as well. So that's going to be great fun. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Kate, what about what about you? You used to have lots of uh, uh, lots of teaching done. Yeah, no, I think I've I think I worked out about a third of my working hours are going to be teaching next year. So, which is good. You know, I'm really enthusiastic about you know bringing in new people and getting them excited. Yeah, and yeah, and it's also the ideas they and it's and it's and it's what they bring in as well because they they they're coming in from different disciplines. Mm. I think this is something that that Kate and I sort of agree on is that you know you get this cross fertilization of ideas and ways of working and as a teacher it opens up avenues for you as well especially when they come in and say i want to do this how do you do that and you're having to go oh, and you've got to think and you've got to do it and, you, and you're working with them and it is a, it, i think teaching is extraordinarily exciting absolutely and it, and it and encourages you to think about your own practice because perhaps mm. you just do it without thinking and then they're like, well, why have you done it like that? And you're like, well, I guess because my teacher 25 years ago told me to do it like that. And they're like, well, why don't you do it like this? And I'm like, oh, OK. And, and it, quite often you're learning from the students as much as you are teaching. Yeah, it's very yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a yeah. two-way thing. Yeah, very much um, so, yeah. And we're, we're, we're talking, well, Designer Bookbinds are talking to two possible new courses, which might happen with fingers crossed. Um, because mm. we all have been banging on about for a very long time. There are no courses left in the UK. Um, we're doing our best to you know, hold up our own end. But um, yeah, no, it's exciting. There's, um... That's that's something I, I, I was always surprised with, uh, that uh, in the United States, uh, there are a lot of opportunities to, to uh, study bookbinding, full-time, part-time uh, courses, short courses, long courses, anything. Uh, but in, in the United Kingdom, where there is uh, there is this huge tradition of bookbinding, uh, where the, there is almost nothing besides you know separate courses uh, provided by individual bookbinders or something like that. This is just just bizarre. And uh, there are there are city and guilds providing even even in Russia there are there are long term <laughs> courses. You know, uh, what do you mean even in Russia? <laughs> they are more ex well. I, I mean I mean the the tradition of bookbinding was almost lost in during the soviet uh, era so uh, for russia it's 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 a real problem to you know recreate this tradition and uh, uh, bring it back but uh, uh, to 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 say to be to be fully you know uh, to for for full disclosure when i was uh, looking for courses in 2014 2015 for myself i i realized that to study for for a full month in moscow it would cost more than to pay for for my uh, three weeks of study at the american academy of bookbinding uh cover uh flight uh, pl uh plane tickets and the part of, of mm -hmm. housing there in telluride uh then to study at, at these courses in moscow uh which were i'm not sure if they were better uh there the the, the the issue is that they were focused uh, they were created for uh people from uh, governmental institutions who can pay a lot of money you know just for kicks or for something so nobody cares about money <laughs> so that's a different issue <laughs> absolutely i think it's, it's really important that education is affordable though as well because a, a lot of uh, the only way for learning bookbinding here is 
going privately, um, then it becomes really, really quite expensive. And there's a bit of subsidizing, but it, it means that we're very much a, a very narrow structure of society you are currently working in. Yeah, there is that, but there are, there are, there are avenues. I mean, I teach privately and you know, I, I have to be realistic in my pricing. But it depends on on, on what you're, you're 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 getting for your money. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the you know that you can spend, you know, a week learning, or you can spend a morning learning. I mean, if you get a really good tutor for one no, no, morning, it's worth, it's worth a lot of money. Then, then it's worth doing because you're going to save so much more time, yeah, and effort and travel and everything else. And it, it is one of these things, is that there are, in in the UK and around the world, there are a lot of people teaching bookbinding and book arts and associated disciplines but and this is where again you may get some dislike little sort of little emojis probably and I'll, I'll get sort of stuff through the letterbox um is oh my address is number one london by the way <laughs> is um um is that yeah, it's the quality of tuition you've got to be very very careful about because if you're a beginner you don't know if the quality of your tuition is good or bad. You've got no idea because you're a beginner. And um, you, you, it is extraordinarily difficult to get it. And nowadays, so many people are relying on the internet to get tuition. And to be honest, to be honest with you, that's okay to a certain extent, but to really learn, you've, you've got to, You've got to be next to the teacher. The teacher's got to physically put your hands in the right place. You know, how much pressure do I use? Well, it's this man, feel what it is. And there's just so much, you, there's just so much that is lost in, should we say, distance learning. And it's also, you know, you, you haven't got the equipment yourself as a student. You, you, you know, what do I do? What, what do you mean you haven't got a finishing press? Well, I haven't got a finishing press. Well, you need a finishing press to do module two. Well, I don't have a finishing press. And it's and it goes and it goes backwards and forwards and, and this sort of thing. And I think I think that 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 um, what has happened over the last couple of years because of the pandemic and everything else is people's reliance on this medium, this medium to learn. And um, it, it, it's I think we I think uh, Richard's uh, sort of notion of you know, things are grinding to a start I think is, is right. perfect is perfect we've got to crank things up again we've got to get real we've got to we've got to do it we've got to get there um, really sorry I'm gonna be unbelievably rude oh, I have to leave now no I'm not stopping because because of you <laughs> thank you very much guys <laughs> sorry happy I'm holiday sorry. Happy, happy holiday happy <laughs> holiday glad uh, I could see you for this brief moment yeah yeah Have see, a wonderful see, time. see you next time bye. yeah bye 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 Kate it's lovely to see you and you bye bye bye, bye. <laughs> oh, Richard uh, oh, what, 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 what about you and your uh, moated mansion. Do you get any students? Do you teach? I teach in the online courses. Uh, I don't teach much here. I had one student uh, for a while this uh, this year uh, who would uh, come here and was um, uh, had studied with you know other bookbinders and was just looking for something in particular. And but mostly I teach. I've been teaching online this year. Uh, things that you can teach online, like uh, uh, critique. So I, mm -hmm. I, I ran critique workshops where people could present their work. And I, it was useful because I had them make videos and demonstrate online, learn a vocabulary to explain their work, study mm -hmm. different methodologies of criticism so they could talk about the haptics, they could talk about the metadata, they could talk about the relation of material, image, and metaphor, and they could... Uh, uh, present their work in a comprehensible way, and mm -hmm. uh, and since it was on Zoom, they they were given thirty. This is through the Center for Book Arts, and uh, that's great. And so they had the <laughs> opportunity to review their performance as well and critique their performance. So that was all. All of that is good because it also helped them to be able to promote their work. And it wasn't just bookbinders; it was librarians, curators, book dealers. Um, uh, writers who write about uh, book art, and uh, as, as well as the artists. So it, it covered the, the five different elements of any art form. 
uh, you know, of who came so that they all got to be, so a dealer has to be able to present the work, a writer has to have a vocabulary to write about it, the artist has to be able to analyze their work while they're making it and critique it while it's going and to see if it's working or if it's not working, uh, what's what can you do with it to uh, make it better. And, uh, and the collector has to be able to do the same thing in order to determine whether something fits within their collecting parameters or expands their collection. So all of those kinds of people were simultaneously in these classes and got to talk to each other about these things, which was interesting. And then I started um, again teaching for the first time uh, just um, uh, a couple of months ago at the Center for Book Arts live, uh, printing on the iron hand press, which I love teaching. and. We have a nice uh, uh, royal folio size, you know, like 20 something by 30 something inch uh, hand press. And uh, it's such a pleasure printing on that kind of equipment and nobody uses it. Everyone prints on proof presses, you know, like Vander Cooks or whatever. And, uh, you know, I'm a old, I like, you know, platen presses and I like big rotor. I like machines that are, you know, print 4,000 an hour with a reciprocating bed. You know, I, I, I like that kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, people are generally, a lot of people are like the Center for Book Arts when I was in England uh, in 78, 79, I was uh, uh, on a fellowship there. And while I was gone, the Center for Book Arts got rid of all of the big uh, motorized presses and switched over to Vandercooks because they were scared that some, they were scared that people would be like stoned and drunk and hurt themselves on it, which might not have been unreasonable in 78. But, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with tripping while you're operating a uh, big printing press. Come on, it's fun. I'll 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 bring something back and. Uh, oh my god! Uh, you you spoke about uh, large printing presses, and uh, here's something I found uh, uh, some time ago on on the flea market in, in the That's Netherlands. That's adorable. <laughs> yeah, and I want to 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 make some uh, 3D printed. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, 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 I, like, I, re like replicas? Uh, like beans? Stuff to print on it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Mattresses. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have the vocabulary, sorry. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is a lovely thing I never used, but I, I, I really want to, to try using it. And, uh, 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 it it even has uh, some uh, some lead type with it, but it's almost just uh, uh, dis, dis, uh, not destroyed, but uh, uh, fallen apart. So uh, yeah, it's not usable. And I wanted to ask you about big stuff. What's the biggest book or the biggest project, like in terms of size, that you ever worked on? Where did you go overboard? That's that's two different questions. Where did you go overboard, and what's the biggest thing you want? To do? Uh, well, I think for me, there's a um, I don't know if you're familiar with is the book of Gormenghast, which um, I'm not terribly familiar with, but the BBC did an ad adaptation of it. Mm -hmm. Oh and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they came into um, the bindery I was working. It's just a two. You know, it's the boss, and there was me. But sorry, there was a guy here drinking the coffee, smoking the cigarettes, answering the phone, and then there was me um, <laughs> doing yeah. basically the same thing, uh, minus uh, answering the phone. Yeah, I, I was doing exactly the same thing, minus answering the phone, drinking plus, coffee, plus smoking cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing all, and I was doing everything else. And and some and some guys from the BBC came in, and they were hello we're from the BBC. And we went, yeah, I'd say, and. Uh, because the BBC, as soon as they say the BBC, you, uh, they expect everybody to go, oh, it's the BBC. Yeah. No. Nah. And they say, yeah, we're doing an adaptation of Gorman Gust. Uh, we went, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. We need two books because the law, the rules of law, which are two huge books, are carried on the backs of guys. And the, these guys have to transport them around. So I think we made books that were basically about five foot high, by about how many centimeters? I'm just looking for something more. So by about 20, 22 centimeters thick. And they had to work, you know, properly so they could open them and everything else. And I said, I said to the to, to, you know, to you know, to the, the guys from the BBC, I said, Do you know how much this is gonna weigh? And they said, no, I said, 
it's only paper. I said, do you know how much paper weighs? And I, they went, well, it's, it'll be all right. I said, okay, right, fine. <laughs> so the guy drinking the coffee, smoking the cigarettes and answering the telephone said, yeah, fine. And they sorted out the budget. Anyway, I made these. And for once, the guy answering the phone, smoking the cigarettes and drinking the coffee did actually do some work. <laughs> and we made these two books and they weighed, a, a, you know, I mean, we're talking 60, 70, 80 kilos each. And so the guys from the BBC came back and we said, well, there they are. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, please take them with you. <laughs> and so you got the, you know, so, so this guy said, oh, yeah, yeah. I tried to lift it up. And he said, oh, it's too heavy. And I said, we did tell you how much you wanted a working book this is what it is and everything else like this so then and see this big thing and all the rest of it so what we had to do was hollow half the book out okay and then stick in dummy pages of the bits they'd be reading on telly as it were and did it like that but what a f faffle this is one of the problems so many people they come in with these great ideas and say oh yeah we want this we want it to work and everything else and you give them the benefit of your advice however many years it was at that time, I'd only been working professionally seven years, say. And, and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, but we know what we want. You think, okay, right, fine, I'll do what you want. But it's not going to work. And, they, and lo and behold, it didn't. So that was the biggest book, series of books I've worked on. So pe people are stupid, but at least some of them uh, are ready to pay some money. Well, the BBC don't like spending money. Okay. No, no the, it's quite seriously, they don't, that, because they say, oh, we'll make sure you're in the credits. You're never in the credits. Okay. Well, it is, well, it is your money they, uh, they don't want to spend. I, I assume you're on the television still. Do you, you I'll, I'll tell you something about the BBC. I'll tell you something about the BBC. They earn more money from sales of their programs to other broadcasters than they do from the license fee in the United Kingdom. Okay. Now, there is a there is a thing. If you're the talent and you go on the television or the radio, whatever it is, they don't actually say to you, oh, you can claim a wage and travel expense. They don't tell you this. They invite you. You go along and do your bid on radio or whatever, as has happened to me on a couple of occasions. And then you go, right, fine, can I, is there a form for expenses or anything? And everybody all of a sudden disappears. And you're left in the middle of the BBC building with nobody around. And you say, can, can I it's, at least pay my taxi? Is it, hello? And it, and it is, uh, they are so much like that. They really, really are. You know, you, uh, but you're doing it for the BBC. And you say to them, are you getting paid? Well, yes, of course, it's my job. Well, you've asked me to do my job on your program. I want paying as well. And it's, they're not the world's best. So, uh, Richard, if you, if you are uh, talking about the largest books, what, what's your experience? <laughs> Pavel started it. <laughs> well, I could talk about a large book, and I could also talk about going overboard. Yeah, um, that's also fun. For, that, for 10 years, better. I had my book bindery on my boat which was a 46 foot Chris Craft constellation, 25,000 pounds of mahogany, you know, <laughs> and a couple of V8 engines. And uh, so um, there was a lot of overboard on that. I bet there was, yes, I can imagine. <laughs> um, but, uh, in terms of a big book, I think the biggest book I made was in 1976. In 1975, I went to the first North American hand paper makers conference that Joe Wilfer organized uh, in Wisconsin. He had the upper U.S. paper mill uh, there, and um, he uh, got together 25 or so, 30 hand uh, paper makers. And that was really interesting in 1975. And I went there, and they were such an exciting group. So Because the Guild of Book Workers that time was mostly uh, pink tea ladies, and they were very proprietary that? about their... Um, uh, I do the French style, it's the best. I do the German style, it's the best. I do the English style, it's the best. If you don't do my style, I can't show you because you didn't study with so-and-so. You know? <laughs> um, and it was like that. Um, whereas I did the American style, which is uh, which I'd learned from my teacher, Dan Knowlton, which was take everything from everybody and use whatever you need you know, at the time. And 
that was considered radical, you know, <laughs> at the time. Anyway, the paper makers, on the other hand, everybody was sharing information as, uh, oh, I, let's do this. How do you do that? You know, and, and they were a great- Radical, problem. that's almost, almost socialist. Well, what I, what I did was I got back uh, to the Center for Book Arts and I said, you know, I should make a book. So I asked each of the paper makers to send me a 17 by 22 sheet of something they did, an eight by 10 photograph of themselves at work and an eight and a half by 11, the standard American typing paper size, uh, I say typing paper because you know this is before computers, and uh, this was um, uh, you know about why were they making paper by hand in 1975? So they each sent me those three things, and I made a book where each one of them had a page, and I had to make a little box frame about every page, and I made it into a two-volume accordion book where each so it was like a 17 by 22 plus, uh, but. Uh, it opened up to two 51 foot volumes. So it was a 102 foot long book. So they gave me uh, one of the, it was exhibited around the world, but at, at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, they had an octagonal room with a door in one side and they had the two volumes, one over the other going around the other walls, oh, all the way around. So you got to walk into the book when you opened the door. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. I mean, that, that uh, uh, a few years ago, we, we should the... we should translate it into centimeters somehow because uh, I, I I've been lost in the middle of big. it. So it was very, many very centimeters, big, very big, <laughs> very big. Big <laughs> load of paper, yeah. About a, about a hundred meters, I uh, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Big. I think I think actually when you mentioned uh, doors, um, I worked um, a few years ago now with a poet. And there was a new museum gallery opening in Liverpool, uh, which is a small I, I thought you worked with doors. Yeah, we worked with doors. And um, um, and and those and and, and th they were books. They were metaphors for, you know, we did concertinas and they were you know, big these big chunky things. So that was one of the things uh, that we did. But it reminds me, I, I went to a uh, an exhibition by of, of Anselm Kiefer's work, which was at the Guggenheim in Bilbao. This is a few years ago now. And it featured quite a lot of his, as Richard mentioned, these walk-in books that he produces, you know, with sunflowers and lead and all the rest of it. And it was, uh, it was a real experience. And I think this is one of the things, I mean, Richard actually touched on this, <coughs> is, if you are immersed in it, if it becomes sculptural, if it becomes something else, it ceases to be a book. It becomes a work of art in the, you know, in in in, in the everyday language, shall we say? And I think that's actually quite stunning. I mean, are you thinking of doing anything else like that again, Richard? Oh, I gave up thinking years ago. It was really oh, no, 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 no. You 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 can't go on automatic pilot. I mean, why not? Well, because that, that's why accidents happen. Well, I still have my fingers this morning, um, you know, and uh, well, that well, doesn't mean I'll have them this afternoon. That's just how life is, you know. I, well, I, I, I discovered that I would think and think and think, and then I do something and it would be wrong. I'd start thinking again, and I do something else, and that was wrong. And I realized if I eliminated all the time I spent thinking, and I just did the first thing that came to mind, I'd find out it was wrong right away. And then I could do something else. And so I can go through all the wrong things faster than even thinking of the first one. Uh, exactly, exactly. And eventually you'll find the one thing that isn't wrong, that isn't necessarily right, but it's getting there. And I understand that. I well, understand that the way works. you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah it yeah. works. It doesn't necessarily work in the way you expected it to work, but That's it right. works. Hopefully and it, it could... didn't work the way I expected. And I, and I get to be excited about something that uh, I never anticipated. That's called that's called serendipity. So, what it? was your biggest biggest mistake? What are those things oh, 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 that you regret oh, doing? Oh, 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 oh. Regret doing. <laughs> Regrets. I had a few. Had a few. <laughs> and I, um, I, I, I was going to sing. I was I was going to play light my fire when you were talking about the doors. Yeah, <laughs> right. Come on, baby, loud my fire. Well, yeah, it was actually quite cool because we had stuff from Liverpool Football Club, Everton Football Club. Also, it was it, it, cool. Anyway, that, that was some time ago. But th yeah, biggest regrets. Yeah, loads, loads of regrets. I mean, book, books wise. Oh, I see. Right. Oh, 
Oh, of course, it's a book by Link Bookhouse Program, isn't it? Um, I was thinking, I was thinking about the the tire purchased last week. That was terrible. I mean, it was awful. It was this yellow thing. I just didn't go with anything I've got. Uh, regrets with books. Richard, would you take that for a minute? Because I just got to get another beer. Well, uh, yeah, the, the, I, I occasionally regret the book I didn't buy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I have some of this as well. <laughs> now, well, what do, what do you collect? Do you, ha do you have a particular narrow, uh, narrow, unusual field where? You... Uh, yeah, uh, American publishers' bindings, American decorated publishers' bindings. Uh, I've written. Uh, I I put on. You know, this is a gallery that I'm in here. This is my gallery. And um, you know, you see that there's a you know exhibit case here, and there's you know, exhibit cases all around. And I put on exhibitions. I have done some book art exhibitions. I rarely exhibit my own work, but I can tell you about that when that's coming up. But most of what you see here is American publishers' bindings. And here, you know, I'm, you know, I just grab what's in front of me. I mean, here's you know, you know, stuff like this. And I I started collecting because I wanted to see. How did they do it? They had these, um, you know, I'm, my favorite tool is the Kensol. Uh, I have a three ton Kensol, you know, hot stamping press. And I used to teach that at Center for Book Arts. But I saw these things from the late 19th century that were astounding glittery things that, you know, as you hold them, the, the light shimmers at different, at different angles, different parts of it light up. And I wanted to know how they did it. So I started buying the books and then I, you know, you know, and I got more and more of them. And, and then I got an assistant um, who a guy came up and said, I want to be your assistant. He lived not far from here in the middle of nowhere and had heard about me. He said, I want to be your assistant. So I said, okay. And so, but it turned out he had done some book catalog and he said, you should catalog these. I said, I don't know how to catalog. He said, I do book cataloging. He cataloged like 500 of these that I had. I put on this exhibition here. I issued the catalog and sold the whole collection to a rare book library at the University of Alabama, but the books kept coming. So I put on another exhibition of 300 of them and cataloged them and photographed them and everything. I, used, I was a museum photographer for a while, you know, so I knew how to take a picture. And so then I sold that collection to uh, uh, Indiana University's Lilly Library. Then another 300, I sold that to the Boston. I kept putting together these collections, you know, a particular design or a theme like Native American themed book covers. And I kept selling these catalogs as limited editions that, and I would hand sew each one and buy, you know, and I, and all that. And I would stamp one of the covers, you know, and on cloth and, and so I learned how, I learned the tricks of how you make the engraving dies uh, so that they reflect gold at different angles. Cause when you etch or cut by hand or anything, you're making a, a cut like this. So you're reflecting the light like that. So if you make your cuts at different angles, it reflects it. Well, I found this out by taking a loop and putting it on these books and seeing how did they, uh, sometimes they were etched, sometimes they were mezzotints or aquatints or mm -hmm. steel rolled onto the plate. And so I saw all these different techniques. So when I issued, George Brazilla published a trade edition. I have one, I have one here. Oh, here's my, my 3D uh, and turning my self portrait into a 3D. When you, you should see it when, when you put on the 3D glasses, the eyes really follow you everywhere. Anyway, that's another, you know, I should probably put them on. Of course, what's the point of not wearing 3D glasses when you can, you know? Okay, here's exactly. one that was, here's an unopened copy of the very rare now out of print. Brazilla said, uh, now he was 95 years old. You know, this is the great George Brazilla who published like the books of hours of the Duke de Berry and the first book of Jackson Pollock's and, and all that, you know, work. And he had been a friend for like 40 years, but we never did anything together. We just like, you know, met and had breakfast together and stuff and talked. But then one day after he saw my third exhibition of this stuff here, this, there goes the shrink wrap, right? You know, you know you've got a fresh one here. <laughs> um, and um, this is the second. So he said, we have to make um, 2,000 of these or we can't afford to do it. They print them in China, the best printing that they had in, uh, done in China, actually. Uh, beautiful printing. And he said, uh, but he said, it may take years to sell them. 
they sold out in a week. So uh, we got stuck with like all these orders and no books, but you see, uh, I did get that effect. At yeah. certain angles, it lights up. Uh, now here I have, I don't have a, the right kind of light on it so you can quite get it, but- Still can certain, see it, yeah. But, but no, but some light, parts of it go light and parts of it go dark at different angles. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's. I, th I think jewelers use it. They call it faceting, where you cut it, you cut dyes. Yeah, it's kind of like yeah, that. And yeah, what I yeah. did here was instead of engraving it or doing it like that, I took a, a flat gold uh, cover of one of the things that's in the book, and scanned it, made it into solid uh, black. You know, because it just has you know for making an engraving die, and then I applied textures in Photoshop where the textures ran at different angles to different parts. So different parts would light up at certain mm -hmm. angles. And then uh, sent the uh, file off to China over the internet. This is 2010. And they made the die and stamped them. They came back and it worked. That was Fantastic. the amazing thing. Yeah, cool. And, and uh, so it took 19th century technology and 21st century methodology and skipped that whole messy century in the middle. Yeah, the dirty, dirty century. Dirty Nobody century. likes that one. Yeah, no, yeah. That, that was a, that was a especially, especially, especially in Russia. Well, some it's people, Russia. some people somehow like it, but not not Pavel and I. It wasn't good for the Jews that century. Definitely. It, uh, who was what it century good? is? Who was it good exactly for? I mean, the capitalists. Name. Well, yeah, <laughs> capitalists profiteered quite a lot. That's yeah, true. yeah, they did great. <laughs> Unlike in, <laughs> unlike in other centuries, right? I mean, come on. Well, just even more than in other centuries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. O over the pandemic, the billionaires got about 50% uh, richer. <laughs> I don't know about you. I haven't. <laughs> well. What's, the, what's <laughs> that? There's a very famous I, saying. I, I had a, a very... pretty good year. <laughs> There's a very famous saying, if you want to make a small fortune in bookbinding, it starts with a large fortune. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Off read the print uh, your tools. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this was Cyberbinding's podcast, uh, Holiday Edition. And uh, Holiday. As cheers, usual, everybody. As usual, cheers, everybody. Please cheers. Check, check the links below. We'll post the links to. Uh, Richard shared with us uh, and uh, we will share some more links as well. Please consider becoming our patrons on Patreon because uh, your money or money of our patrons help us to edit the podcast. Without this money, we wouldn't be able to do that. So uh, it's pretty important to us and uh, we cherish the support of our patrons quite a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for staying with us and see you next time. Happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, happy new year. Happy holidays. Kanza, Be safe. Else? Yeah. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everybody.